Coming up on DTNS, should software be protected? The Queen of England is on the cutting edge of tech, and a new era in aeronautics presages a great era in flight. It's the biggest tech stories of this, the year of our Lord, 1976. <laughs> This is the Daily Tech News Show, best of 1976. Here, celebrating the bicentennial in Greenville, Illinois, I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Santa Cruz, I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Let's look back at the top tech stories of 1976. Some of us may be time travelers and uh, occasionally show knowledge that we possibly shouldn't have. Just... Bear with us. Uh, Microsoft's Bill Gates wrote an open letter to hobbyists, first published back in February of 1976, in the Homebrew Computer Club newsletter in Mountain View, California. It was also published in the Micro 8 Computer User Group newsletter, as well as Computer Notes, Mini Computer News, People's Computer Company, and Radio Electronics Number 5. The letter was in response to users copying code to implement BASIC on the MITS 680B, which is based on Motorola's 6800 processor. Of course, we all know hardware has to be paid for, but software is just something you put into the hardware. Uh, you can just copy it. And Gates objects to this because it means that he and his friends are selling fewer quote-unquote copies of their version of BASIC, which Gates argues costs money to develop. He also argues that this prevents good software from being written because there's no financial incentive for people to sink in the investment to write good software. Gates asked people to voluntarily pay for the software that they have copied. <laughs> good luck with that. <laughs> and gave out the company's New Mexico address for such purpose, as well as welcoming suggestions or comments, which I thought was nice. Gates wrote, quote, Nothing would please me more than being able to hire 10 programmers and deluge the hobby market with good software. Oh, wow. Uh, where do we start with the idea of, in 1976, people being like, hold on, so somebody could just, like, steal software? That isn't right. They should, they should not do that. No, I, Bill Gates obviously doesn't understand the hobbyist world he's living in, or perhaps uh, he ju he does understand it and is trying to bully people into paying for something that's free. Software is free in 1976. I, the idea yeah, that, that, you could, I that mean, you could hold software not in, for that, long, you, that not you could for somehow... Long. Well, I don't know where you're getting I, this idea from. Sarah. I, I would like to interject uh, that I would like to draw an analogy, if, if I may. Uh, you are allowed to write on a blank piece of paper any sort of letter, correspondence, piece of fiction, or, or perhaps an observation, and submit it and hand it out free to anyone that would be willing to read it. However, we, author, we also have authors, reporters, uh, people who also use the same system in order to jot down their thoughts, and yet they demand some level of compensation. For a journalist, it's to be paid by a newspaper. For an author, it's to be paid for their book by their publisher. I mean, I, is it any different? I get where you're coming from, Roger, but traditionally, software is just the thing that makes the hardware run, and you're taking away my right to run it the way I want, because maybe the way I want to run the software is similar to someone else. Uh, I don't want to get into a George Harrison situation uh, where I'm getting sued by the chiffons because my sweet lord is similar to he's so fine. Uh, I don't want that to apply to software. I want software to be like a recipe. If I have a recipe for a great uh, mushroom casserole, uh, I'm not going to get sued by the Campbell's company for passing that along. Recipes are free. Anybody can make them because everybody cooks. Same with software. Everybody writes software. You can't say my recipe for executing instructions on the chip is is somehow protected. That's ridiculous. Yeah, but like if you had a player piano, would you not play for the music scroll that would be needed for it to play? The music, or do you think all that music that's been 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 pre uh, pre processed uh, be allowed f uh, free access by anyone who wants it without payment or compensation? 
it's a, it's whether do we want software to be treated as as a as music or as as uh, as food? That that's really pretty much what it comes down to. Turns out, Tom, you have to pay for both. No, you don't. No one <laughs> pays for software. Not in 1976. Software. No one pays for Listen. software in 1976. Why do you think Bill Gates had to write <laughs> letters to obviously? Sorry, newsletters? it's hard for me to. I I'm like, wait, no, we're in 1976. <laughs> got it. Got it. Um, well, speaking of 1976, a, a little thing happened on the way to the theater. Uh, Homebrew Computer Club member Steve Wozniak and his partner Steve Jobs took the world by storm with an affordable, adaptable, open microcomputer called the Apple for $666.66. Ha ha. Offered a video terminal and eight kilobytes of RAM on a single PC card. Hey, how about that? The company emphasized that uh, its version of BASIC is free and has stated that, quote, our philosophy is to provide software for our machines free or at minimal cost. See, Apple gets it. Steve Wozniak gets it. The software isn't where you make the money. Uh, people will write <laughs> software. They'll want to write software for their machines. This is an ingenious mini computer, though. This is, uh, you know, a, a very efficient board that Wozniak has made here. That's a, it's it's really incredible. I'm impressed because, of, as we all know, coming from the Altair and and other hobbyist kits, this this goes some way to reducing the the gap between the everyman and the enthusiast who prefers to work on their own electronics and mm -hmm. has the know-how, the tool set, and frankly, the time to put one of these together. I think in the future, we might see more of these and perhaps a completed model uh, from you know a large uh, retailer like a Montgomery Wards or a JC Penney's or even mm. a Macy's. I, I, yeah, I think what I love about this is all you need is the case, really. Uh, you know, And Apple's talking about possibly offering a second version of its computer uh, that, that would include the case. Can you imagine how accessible that would be if, you know, everyone, not just us, but everybody could just pick up a computer, plug it in, and, and start going? I think, I think I'm most impressed by the included video terminal. I mean, like mm. having some form of video output instead of just outputting straight to a printer uh, yeah. or or heaven forbid even just like a punch card i think mm -hmm. is is pretty impressive considering uh the price that they're asking i mean that's that's relatively cheap i mean i mean my 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 mom's my mom's bank uh, uh, uh had to put down more than 2 million dollars for oh, yeah. a the computer price just, to, is, just is, to, is, is like nothing for yeah. for a computer. your mom's bank had to put down 2 million dollars yeah, to pay for to pay for a mini computer that did the uh, wow i mean she t she had to spend an entire course at uh, the University of San Francisco to learn how to program it on punch cards. I have stacks of them at home. Wow, it that is, is this is a most impressive feat. <laughs> Imagine Sarah though, if you didn't have to do that, if you could just buy a computer already in a case, you don't have to do any assembly even. Sounds and plug great. It in your, like your television. As yeah, I don't want that hassle. And and it comes with basic. How crazy is that? You don't need to understand how the chip works. You have a very <laughs> and it's easy only use. Six hundred sixty-six dollars and sixty-six cents. You have a very I mean, you have a very easy human understandable programming language. Basic. I mean, it's as forgive the pun as basic as you can get. And that price is only going to come down, right? I mean, that that sure, it seems like a lot in 1976. I'm guessing an Apple computer in 10 years will cost you like 100 bucks. Oh, well, you know, we, we are in a period of uh, high inflation, so maybe 300 bucks. Sure. Yeah, I mean, 76, you know, kind of crazy year. Bicentennial, after mm -hmm. all. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, who knows? Who knows? Who knows? All right. Electronic mail. I, I, I know most of you all out there have heard of it, uh, but it's a perk that's available to people who work in academic institutions, military institutions, people who have access to ARPANET uh, and know how to work the system. But that may be changing. Back in March, while visiting the Royal Signals and Radar Establishment in Malvern, England, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II sent an electronic mail of her own. 
Uh, the Royal Signals and Radar Establishment had just implemented electronic mail, uh, and the, uh, the Queen becomes the first head of state to send electronic mail. Oh, of course, one of the first people to send it. There's not that many people using it. She was identified on the system as HME2, Her Majesty Elizabeth II. Uh, the Queen announced a new language available on the system in her electronic mail, which read... This message to all ARPANET users announces the availability on ARPANET of the Coral 66 compiler provided by the GEC 4080 computer at the Royal Signals and Radar Establishment, Malvern, England. Coral 66 is the standard real-time high-level language adopted by the Ministry of Defense. I love how you were like kind of doing her voice, even though I didn't want to clearly totally she, did, she didn't yeah. actually write this. I, I, I felt the pinky finger. With the teacup <laughs> a in little, my head as you're saying that. This what? message to all ARPANET users. Adopted by the Ministry of Defense. Ah, it's, I mean, can you, this, this, I think, signals. This is, this is uh, honestly like, okay, I, I know we're, I know we're supposed to be in 1976. So like, let's totally say I'm in 1976 at this point. Yeah, no, we are. We, we totally, totally are. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's. Th Gerald Ford. Feels very, uh, I don't know, forward thinking on the part of the uh, the queen majesties. Yeah, the, <laughs> the queen. The queen is very tech forward. Uh, it's not the Apparently first. So. Big, you could you could write this off, especially because she was obviously sending a pre-prepared message. You could write this off as like, oh, they brought her and told her push a button. She probably didn't even know what was going on. She knew what was going on. Uh, in fact, I'll predict, Sarah, in the future, she'll have something called an iPod mini of her own. Oh, please, <laughs> Tom. Don't get yeah. crazy. But no, she she historically, and I imagine it will continue that way, uh, is very interested in in technology. So even if she didn't compose the message very clearly, uh, I bet she she was curious and asked questions about how it all worked and, and, and was very, very into it. I mean, in in all honesty, for you know, a lot of people who are like email, I I don't know, I heard about in e email. the That's mid nineties kind of thing. This is, I mean, it, this is pretty this is pretty major. Think, I, think about this in nineteen seventy six. This mm -hmm. is something that 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 was happening. That sure, the consumer market wasn't you know, uh, 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 wasn't available to to them. But it, but it, but it already existed, and it had had been, had been going for some time. And yeah. helped, this helped popularize it, right? This yeah. helped get more people to understand it was a thing that could happen. What I find interesting is that the uh, the um, the British monarchy is so forward looking. I mean, it's a, it's not just the electronic mail that that's so impressive. Is that just through the ages they've adopted a lot of new technologies like the telephone, they've. Uh, mm. And and the, the number of tele television, but I mean they they were things that weren't just treated as mere curiosities, sure, but as sure, sure. but as things that definitely have some sort of future that could be implemented not just within with the realm of like aristocracy or, or anything like that, but you know a usable technology for the benefit of the nation. Uh, if you have a thought about something that we're talking about on the show, uh, drop us a letter. Uh, of course, we're at 11870 Santa Monica Boulevard, number 106553, Los Angeles, California, 90025. Or if you have access to electronic mail, you can use that. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Oh, Tom, who has that? I know. It's, uh, maybe this episode, Sarah, will last long into the future, past the year 2000, <laughs> and be heard by people who think of e electronic mail as just a regular part of their everyday lives. 1976 saw big advances in not just aeronautics, but aerospace. So let's start with space. The first of NASA's two unmanned spacecraft sent to Mars landed on July 20th. The Viking 1 sent back photos of the Martian surface. The lander has two cameras, three analyses from metabolism, growth or photosynthesis, a grass chromatograph mass spectrometer, an X-ray fluorescence spectrometer, pressure, temperature, and wind velocity sensors, a three-axis seismometer, a magnet on a sampler observed by the cameras, and various engineering sensors. If there's someone walking around on Mars, the Viking one is going to find them and let us know they're there. While the moon landing program is on pause for now, 
visits may become easier and more frequent thanks to the Space Shuttle. This is a reusable spacecraft that can head off to orbit and then land back on Earth to fly again. It was unveiled September 17th, and the prototype has been named the Enterprise after the famous science fiction vessel in the TV show Star Trek. They were going to name it the Constitution, but Star Trek fans still exist uh, <laughs> and wrote in to convince NASA to name it the Enterprise. In fact, the cast and producer of Star Trek were on hand for the unveiling. The Enterprise is a prototype that will be used to test out all the systems to make sure it's space-worthy before other shuttles are built and launched into orbit. So, while we wait for shuttles to begin taking us frequently to space and back, we'll be able to get around the world even faster right here on Earth, thanks to a supersonic jet, the Concorde, Launched its first commercial flight January 21st from Heathrow, making it to London, making it from London to New York in two hours and 52 minutes. Quite a bit shorter than the weeks it used to take uh, our parents on a ship not that long ago. Goodness gracious. I... Two hours, 52 minutes. Are you kidding me? I, I'm gonna say like the uh, the 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 unmanned spacecraft to Mars is huge. I mean, until you know, until then, we had to live with Bray Bradbury books, Ray Bad Bradbury books, or one or, or one of those, uh, or you know, like you, your your old Red uh, um, Red Planet uh, movies. I think it's kind of cool. I mean, I can't wait to see what we get to see. I mean, kid, do you, do you think there'll be like creatures and stuff they'll catch? Well, that's I mean, the listen, thing, right? it's 1976. I mean, by I don't know. Let's let's get crazy and say like the year 2000. Obviously, we'll all be living on Mars. Well, right. We uh, we have sent a uh, an unmanned spacecraft to Mars. We're about to have frequent shuttles to the moon and back. Basically, mm -hmm. uh, we we'll be able to fly here on yeah, Earth. Well, I mean, by the yeah. year two thousand, two decades. hours and fifty two minutes will be. It'll be like a half hour. You'll you'll be able to just pop over from New York to London in a half hour. You'll be able to take a shuttle. The shuttle to the moon will take two hours and 52 minutes, and there'll probably be people headed to Mars. And, and, and there's and probably going to be like a cool like, place to, like, you know, like, like, a, like a cool restaurant this on is, Mars. This is literally less than 10 years uh, past the, the uh, release of 2001 in the, in the, in the, uh, in the most... 2001 of Space Odyssey. Yeah, Space is Odyssey. I, I, I will predict... That the movie 2001 A Space Odyssey will look dated by the year 2001. You'll look at it and think, oh my gosh, that we're way past that. Yeah, like, can you imagine, like, but, what no, but they actually can, thought was happening? What will it look like? I mean, how can you imagine? I mean, that was so cutting edge. Like, what will it look like? I mean, it, like, my mind struggles to conceive of what wondrous things would actually take its place. Yeah. We'll we'll have we'll have incredibly fast flights. Uh, on, getting around the planet Earth will be nothing. You'll be able to go everywhere. Uh, we'll yeah. we'll be we'll be thirty thirty minutes. We'll be colonizing know? the moon. Doesn't obviously. matter where you live. Thirty Space minutes. Space shuttles flying yeah. us back and forth, uh, and we'll we'll be headed to Mars. Yeah. All right, Sarah. What do we got next? Uh, well, <laughs> uh, you know, kind of come keeping with the uh with the theme. We knew what was coming, uh, happening at the Los Alamos National Laboratory, and that was the first Cray computer. Oh, yes, the first super Cray computer. computer. The Cray 1 installed, not the first supercomputer, but very compact, relatively affordable, seemed pretty great to a lot of folks who were interested in it at the time. Even had a ring of benches around the outside for workers to sit on it while using it. That's how big the Cray was. And while smaller, not lesser. In fact, faster. And it's much larger uh, <laughs> than, than its much larger brethren. The systems improved the performance of math operations and arranging memory and registers to quickly perform single operations on a set of data. Not the first to do it is the Cray, but the first to do it in a way that didn't limit performance. Very important there. How long can it be before every business can afford the price and room to have a supercomputer in the back room? I can't imagine it. You put this news together with the Apple uh, development, and you get an idea that in the future, maybe computers are in every 
place, you know, restaurants, accountants, uh, and those will have cray like things. I bet they'll get smaller and smaller and, and then Apple type things for, for, for the home and everybody's sending electronic mail back and forth. This is supposedly, according to according to the uh, the brochures, uh, this machine will be a uh, uh, capable of processing uh, eighty, uh, or is, is, will be capable of running at eighty megahertz. Also, eighty like, megahertz. Like the uh, the you know you mentioned brochures. Uh, imagine, well, imagine if you will. Uh, being back in the like, how do you share news of this like great new supercomputer brochures? Where where do they go? like? I don't know. The you know they get dropped on people's trade doorsteps? shows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, sales calls, trade shows. I mean, but, yeah. but 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 like, what are you? You have you have to really want to know about this to know about it. I mean, like, is this is this something just for the universities and research institutions and government agencies? No, this or, is much more affordable. But yeah. like, how do we how do we how do we harness this power? I mean, eighty megahertz. Just just so you know, that Apple we we were glowing over is less less than a single megahertz. So yeah. it would take more than eighty of those. You need eighty apples plus to to, and it wouldn't still wouldn't be the equivalent of this processor. That this is a sixty four bit processor. I mean, right now we're working with eight bits, and we still yeah. don't know what to do with it. Also, they're comfy. Have you ever sat on one? I I have not. <laughs> that, I I hope to see that's one. That's the in best person. part of this. Is like, listen, when you have to like hang out with your supercomputer for a while. Yeah, you can you know sit on the side and kind of be comfortable while doing. Yeah, so. when you're when you're you're reading the friggin' manual, you can you can just sit outside and be <laughs> I, like, all right, hold I, on, I'm going to confess something, Tom. <laughs> My I, supercomputer has has a cool seat. I I, I I have a confession to make. I secretly want to see if you can make some sort of game on this device and what mm. it would look like. I mean, right now that we seems have, like a frivolous use of, but, of all but right, of this power. I mean, come on! Right now we have Space Warp, which is a grand game, and 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 it's so much fun. Certainly, but certainly Pong ain't bad either. Certainly, can you imagine the number of people that could be able to to access this machine to play a very immersive game? Imagine why just, would you? Who would let people access their supercomputer to play a I, game? I, what what I'm telling you, Tom, is I think the future will be where people feel entertained as they use this technology because that will coerce mm. or at least indulge them to, to use it more. No, you don't, I you think, don't think they'll so? stay at the pinball arcade myself. Mm. I, right. I, I don't see this sort of thing being wasted on, on frivolous on games. Things. Yeah. Yeah. This I is mean, for, this is for serious use. It's, it's for science, Roger. for science, for business. For accounting, yeah. spreadsheets yeah. could be adapted into things like this. Yeah, you wouldn't have like, having the them spread general out on your public isn't going to like need some sort of like I don't know great big old computer to do but, things. But l let me but, leave let me leave you with this thought: If you had a machine right. this powerful, you could create a simulation of a virtual world, perhaps. Uh, but in that in essence, isn't that kind of a game like? reality as well i mean the same way that space war would replicate on a very abstract level uh, I sure is. you know yeah I, I suppose maybe a small percentage might do that eh, eh. but i i am i can't imagine it turning into an industry i mean I'm, yeah like imagine you, the general public caring about stuff like this right they're no, not that, gonna care about i, I might they're not I, gonna yeah. waste their money on that yeah no. i suppose you're right i suppose you're right and like right. and like even like you know who's who's got like an office room where they're going to put a computer in there and make it like the office room. And yeah. Like, you don't want you, your den is a, is a, is a place where you, you know, escape from the world. Not right. You know. Right. Yeah. Like, I mean, no, nobody's going to do that. It's kind of mm -hmm. crazy. And like the kids won't care. No, no, they're going to be outside playing jarts, yeah. slip and slide, <laughs> playing your <laughs> lawn darts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, all right. I, I think we could we could we could let, let down what little pretense we have left that it's 1976, uh, and and give people a little kind of an overview from. Okay, we've traveled in time to 2021. Uh, 
I think the thing that surprised me and dis and depressed me the most in preparing the show was the aeronautics section. The one where it's like, man, I forgot. I remember all of these stories. I was six years old and I remember looking at the Viking uh, images on the news and thinking, oh my gosh, that's Mars. That's actual Mars. I remember the space shuttle Enterprise flying on the back of an American Airlines jet uh, for its test run and thinking, we're just going to be flying up into space. It's like an airplane. Everybody will be able to get on one. And the Concorde is the most depressing one because we don't even have the Concorde anymore. Like they retired it. We this, we can't go two hours well, and fifty two minutes from Heathrow uh, to to JFK anymore. Yeah, like like <laughs> that sounds great. <laughs> We're not doing that. Well, not in twenty twenty one. What I find most remarkable is kind of the optimistic tone of all these news stories and not just the way not the way they were written but just the way people looked at things as the in future. a very unoptimistic time remember yes. this is the and middle of of the of the ford uh administration in the u.s which was after nixon resigned uh trust in government you think it's low now <laughs> it was real low rampant inflation stagflation and the, you know there's going to be a coming gas crisis which people the I gas think, lines all of that so stuff. yeah I mean, there were a lot of things to look forward to. And I remember as a child, it was a little after the the, uh, the Enterprise when they launched Columbia, which was the first space going space shuttle. The one that actually went and go to space. We yeah. took an entire hour out of my first grade class to watch it on the TV. And our teacher kept telling us, this is a huge moment in history. This is akin to like man landing on the moon. Remember this because it will be something you'll see on a regular basis. And it was up until the last shuttle mission at the turn of the uh, 20th century, and then things kind of fell into a plateau. But the tone is so much promise, so much optimism, mm -hmm. and it is it is very remarkable, especially from the time period it came from. Also, I was trying to, to capture that that feeling, Sarah, uh, of of people in 1976 that that's it's charging for software. Bill Gates was a nut. People thought Bill Gates was a greedy nut when he wrote this letter. And it's it's just so difficult to to put yourself in that mindset in the world we live in now, where it's like, no, you piracy is, everybody agrees piracy is bad. Even people who do piracy know they're sneaking around doing something. And it was well, not that way. And 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 just like the, the idea that somebody who's like, listen, I know what I'm doing and you can't, you know, copy this, that's not right. And that that still isn't right. And there are a lot of lawsuits, uh, you know, uh, every day about that sort of thing. Yeah. But the fact that there 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 weren't really many software, uh, you know, I don't know. They, there there wasn't a lot of um, software programs to uh, copy at the time. Right. Well, well, and what there was was freely traded. People I, would would you would you would just give people like oh you're using an Altair here take my program and, this is what I, I worked on it you can use it it was that culture that Bill Gates waded into with this open letter he was there was no law around it at the time yeah. and he was trying like to convince like, people don't, like just don't do hey, it well I mean don't give my stuff around you can give your stuff around I guess if you want but I'm trying to build a business over here there sure. was there yeah. was a very and many a lawyer was born well there was a very permissive culture if you went to any I went to my cousin's university campus and it was a thing like you went to the so uh, software lab you went to the computer lab and that mm -hmm. was a thing like people would just have blanks they would come in it's like oh I need to to run this on the other end of campus or whatever, because at the time, remember, home computers were still a very small niche and very expensive thing. And so most people, it wasn't like copying like a movie or, or uh, music where no. you could just take it home. You, you had to go to another part of the campus or a corporation. And, and people, I brought up the recipe, the cooking thing, because that's how people felt in 76. And and then for years afterwards, which is like, no, this is like, you know, maybe if I came up with a really clever piece of software, I'd protect it like a secret recipe like grandma did. But I'm not going to like stop. Most people are like, yeah, yeah, sure. I, I can give you my recipe for making the computer do the thing. Like it was just right. a whole different way. And that's where that piracy clash in the 90s came from is you, you had that sure. you still had that mindset clashing with the bill gates mindset which is like i want to do it differently let me lay out the reasons why it should be done the way i'm talking about uh and and that fizzled out i think in 
during the dot com era. And now everybody's like, oh, yeah, no, software should be protected. It's just a matter of how much and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Don't steal my software, bro. Unless it's open source. We've kind of cordoned off all of the hobbyist uh, mentality into the open source area. Well, if you're open source, okay, then you can give your software away. And that's that's for you all. <laughs> the rest of the business world lives well, around. Well, and that was something that had to be like, that wasn't, that wasn't a thing. No, because you know you had you had to sort of figure out like who kind of feels like software should be shared amongst us all. Okay, open source community, great. Open source was the default in '76. They wouldn't have understood the idea of open source because they're like, well, yeah, all all source code is open. What are, what are you sure. talking about? Until Why would I need to open it? it? You're like, it's already wait open. a second. Yeah, yeah I'm losing yeah, yeah. money. Anyway. Um, also the queen, I mean, I had to shove in the iPod thing there because I don't know if she had other examples. There probably are before the her 76, but, but she definitely is tech forward and has always been so. Um, I mean, it's definitely surprised. It surprised me with the more I learned back, like, you know, a yeah. couple of decades ago, learning about like, you know, how, how the Royal house of Windsor or whatever works. And I, I have actually sat on a cray, uh, at a, at a, uh, the, the, these guys down in, uh, Almost near Santa Cruz, actually. <laughs> oh, the, the the computer uh, barn, or the, yeah, the computer music. barn had a cray uh, that they let me they let me sit down, and it was it was padded. It was very nice. And that was that was. <laughs> I love the idea of like being like I just want to be near you, computer. Well, the, the idea was the so computer was also sit on you. furniture, so you wouldn't have to like you know. <laughs> right. right. It's going to take up go a bunch of space. Else. Make it usable. Yeah. Yeah. What I what I keep forgetting is that Apple didn't start out from a business computer like the rest of like even Commodore oh. was was a comp was a business oriented you know technology company and here's a couple of guys like yeah you know during our spare time we cobbled this together and then well, we're going to build a business out of it Wozniak created a better hobbyist computer and Jobs was like I can help you sell that and and Jobs knew new technology I'm not trying to downplay his his tech specs but it, the Wozniak was the genius who built it Jobs was the genius who knew how to sell it Exactly. And he knew how to sell it to other hobbyists because he wasn't selling it to businesses at first. That came later. He he was a marketing guy, but he also understood the way people used things. Like or would he was a, he was a he was a tech guy, not just a marketing guy. But you're right that his his genius was in knowing how people use things for sure. Well, folks, we want you to be like the Queen. Send us an electronic mail. Our electronic mail address is <laughs> feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We hope you're all having great holidays. Uh, we'll be back with live episodes coming up after the 1st of January. Uh, so come back and see us then. Indeed. And thank you for looking back on the big stories of the year 1976, y'all. What a time to be alive. I had just been born. I can't wait to see what happens in 1977, and we'll do that again next year. We'll be covering it all at dailytechnewsshow.com just as soon as they make the domain name system really widespread. I don't want to hold my breath on that. Probably come in the 80s. Yeah. 